Welcome to Good Libations, which as we know is our show about mixology. I'm Ethel Andrews, I'm a mixologist, and today we're going to talk about tropical drinks. And it's really interesting because Tiki Lounge and Tiki culture was very, very popular in the 60s and also in the 50s and even in the 40s. Polynesian restaurants flourished, Polynesian cuisine, people used to have um, tiki and Polynesian themed parties in their backyards. And of course, those type of drinks were immensely popular at that point in time. And they started to wane a bit, the interest in them in the 70s, but they've never gone totally out of favor. And it's really interesting, of course, we have drinks that originate from the Caribbean, which are tropical drinks. And we have drinks that originated from Polynesia, supposedly, that are tropical drinks also. And specifically, those are the type of drinks that we're going to talk about today. Because as we know, on a previous episode, we talked about mojitos, which come from the Caribbean. Now, interestingly enough, again, the ingredients in tropical drinks, um, some of them sound like they're indigenous to the tropics or to Polynesia. But ironically, the person who first started the interest in tiki culture and in tropical drinks was Trader Vic, um, Victor Bergerin of all people, who actually pioneered the interest in tropical drinks in this country. In 1944, at his first Trader Vic's restaurant, which I think was originally called Hinky Dinks, in Oakland, California, he actually created the Mai Tai. And it's a bona fide fact that he did create the Mai Tai because people assume it was probably from Hawaii or from wherever, we'll say Tahiti, but actually it was not. It was from uh, Oakland, California. And again, the very first Mai Tai, it might surprise you what the ingredients actually are. And they're still made in this style, although not typically in most establishments. The very first Mai Tai had fresh lime, golden rum, um, rock candy syrup, orgeat syrup, which is actually an almond flavored syrup. And in addition to that, um, I believe um, simple syrup. But it didn't have any fruit juice in it to speak. Oh, and yes, also it had uh, orange curacao in it. And orange curacao, we're more familiar with the blue one, is a liqueur that is made from bitter orange peel and it's a tad sweeter than triple sec and significantly sweeter than Cointreau. But anyway, those were the basic ingredients of the very first Mai Tai. And of course, other tropical drinks burgeoned from that point on. And a lot of them have very colorful and interesting names like Suffering Bastards, uh, Missionaries Downfall, Scorpions, Menahunis, and Trader Vic's restaurants, and also to a lesser degree, Don the Beachcomber, featured a lot of those drinks. And they were very well made and very well mixed because again, they didn't use artificial ingredients or mixes of any sort. They were made from scratch and with good quality rum, but not necessarily ostentatiously expensive rum. And of course, there was an establishment in West Los Angeles that some are familiar with called Kelbo's that also made very nice Polynesian drinks. And also Polynesian food again, um, tiki themed parties and all of that sort of thing were immensely popular. And again, those drinks never totally fell out of favor, but a bit of interest was lost in them. But recently, again, because of the nostalgia associated with older cocktails, people are starting to um, get more into them and drink them more. And again, in addition to the Mai Tai, probably the most famous one is the zombie, which of course has that float of Bacardi 151. That's a potent drink. Tastes a bit mild, but it definitely will sneak up on you. And you know, just for some anecdotal evidence, I'd like to get an excerpt, if I may, from Trader Joe's bartending guide about how he pioneered the Mai Tai and then all the um, tropical drinks that spawned from it. And again, he makes mention um, that it was in 1944, he said he was at the service bar in his Oakland restaurant, and some friends of his had come in from Tahiti, of all places. And he decided to make them a tropical drink of his own invention again. And he said he used J. Ray Nephew, which is really a nice Jamaican rum, and then he added um, shaved ice, 
and the orgeat syrup. And then he added all the other ingredients associated with it. And of course, the couple loved it. They absolutely loved it. And then he started making his um, tropical drinks for a Hawaiian cruise ship line, Marston steamship lines, and also in Honolulu um, at his next Trader Vic's restaurant in his Seattle one, he started to make the Mai Tai. So that's kind of some interesting anecdotal evidence. And as he mentions, he is the one who originated it. Um, contrary to maybe popular opinion that it came from somewhere in Polynesia itself. And again, unfortunately, this particular drink and other tropical drinks started to be made in kind of a cloyingly sweet style, especially in the late 60s and early 70s, which probably contributed to the lack of interest in the drink. But again, we can go back to those same basic ingredients. Now, you can get the Mai Tais, again, made with the almond syrup and the rock candy syrup and the curacao and that particular type of golden rum. But I'm going to make something that's a tropical drink that is not exactly a Mai Tai today, but it's kind of a spin in an addition to the Mai Tai. It has different flourishes, but it could definitely be defined as a tropical drink. And again, um, you don't have to use a shaker to make this particular drink. I like to. You could simply stir it if you wish or use a swizzle stick if you wish. But typically I like to start by filling the martini shaker with ice to make this drink. And you can call it anything you want to. I call it a number 19. And there's kind of a story behind that. But that's what I call it. And you'll see how it's made. And you'll see again how to make a basic tropical drink. Anyway, I'll get to the business of trying to break up the ice, which is always difficult and a bit recalcitrant. Although this time the um, top of the shaker was more cooperative. And I mention this every time, but it's always good to keep your ice very, very cold. Um, if ice is not stored properly, it has a tendency to dilute and it also has a tendency to be, oddly, not as cold as it should be. And I know that sounds a bit peculiar because, you know, ice is cold, but if it's not stored properly, it most definitely um, is going to dilute the drink and it's going to have an unpleasantly warm um, finish to it rather than a really, really cold finish. But at any rate, for this particular drink, um, and again, for those of you who prefer it if I measure, because typically I don't measure, I free pour. Um, I like to start with light rum or golden rum, but today we'll just go ahead and use some light rum. And I fill the shaker top about uh, three quarters up with that. And then in addition to that, I add a dark rum. And it doesn't have to be this particular one, it could be any um, of your reasonably decent quality dark rums. And again, we'll say about three quarters of the way up the shaker top. Now, sometimes, depending on what creative flourishes I want to put in it, I might add coconut rum, um, which is what we have here. And sometimes, again, to take away from the cloying finish of tropical drinks, I sometimes like to add Kirschwasser, which is a, a German um, sour cherry liqueur, because it takes away from that particular finish, and it also adds an interesting dimension to the drink that people can't quite figure out. And I only put a couple of drops in it because less is more. We don't want to overdo that particular ingredient. And sometimes for color, I like to put grenadine syrup or maraschino liqueur, depending, in the drink, and I think I'll, I'll do that very thing today. And typically in most establishments, again, um, rather than using the almond syrup, most establishments, if they're making tropical drinks, will use pineapple juice. And some establishments will add orange juice to the drinks, which I do sometimes also, which is perfectly acceptable. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. But pineapple juice tends to be the um, preferred ingredient by the public and also by the lounges themselves. And anyway, 
I also, as you know, love these chimney glasses. To me, the presentation um, with the chimney glass is so much better um, than other styles of glasses, although typically sometimes hurricane glasses are used for tropical drinks. But any tall pedestal drink is uh, glass is fine, but this is the particular one that I like to use. And of course we're going to add lime, fresh lime, to this drink. And uh, I like to add basically a whole lime. I quarter it. And that's another thing too. Um, as you know, I like to squeeze my limes by hand when I make my drinks. And sometimes they can be difficult. So if you have difficulty, you can stick it in the microwave for a couple of seconds, or you can roll it very firmly over a tabletop before you cut it. But that particular lime was pretty juicy, I could tell from the feel of it. And what I think I might do, although typically I like to add it in the glass last, is add the shell. I squeeze, first of all, the fresh lime, because again, you're getting the oils from the peel, um, as well as the juice out of it. Better to do it this way than to use a juicer. Leave the spent shell in there. Squeeze a bit more. And then I'm going to shake it and divest it into the chimney glass. And again, you don't have to use a shaker. You can stir it if you wish because many establishments do that. Um, you can use a swizzle stick or you could use a conventional bar stir. And at any rate, I'm going to divest it into the um, glass at this particular point in time here. And this actually makes quite a, a lovely drink. And again, for the purpose of adding a bit more flavor and also for decorative purpose and a bit of color. And we have just enough grenadine in there to give it a lovely hue, but not look like you're drinking, <laughs> again, a glass of maraschino cherries. And anyway, leaving that spent shell in there adds a bit of color to the drink. And also, typically in a lot of tropical drinks, um, interesting things are done. Um, I like sometimes to float a bit of Chambord liqueur over the top. And again, with a zombie, Bacardi 151 is, uh, is the float. And some uh, people like to use Midori. In fact, a friend of mine, Job Jones, makes a lovely cocktail, a tropical drink, where he has a nice, nice float of Midori on the top. Now, one important thing about floating um, different liquors is the specific gravity of the liquor or liqueur has to be less than what is on the bottom. Otherwise, it is going to seep through and blend through. And also, to float successfully any liqueur, and in this particular case, I'm going to float peach brandy on the top. The easy way to do it, as bizarre as this seems, is to invert a teaspoon and hold it at a slight angle and pour the alcohol over the top. And again, as long as it has a lighter specific gravity than the rest of what is in the glass, you're going to get a nice line of demarcation and a nice float of that liquor. And that adds eye appeal. And also then you're drinking the drink through a layer of whatever that float is which is always kind of interesting. And many people, after that, they kind of mix the drink with, you know, the cocktail stirrer or whatever. But many people like to, to drink that drink through that layer. And also, along these lines, in a future episode, I'm going to talk about making dessert drinks like Brandy Alexander's, White Russians, Black Russians. And with Brandy Alexander's and also Irish coffees and White Russians, um, you add heavy cream to it. Now, some establishments will shake that heavy cream in the shaker and blend it, as an example, with an Alexander with the brandy and the coffee liqueur. But what I like to do is I like to float that cream on the top in a very, very thin layer in that um, glass, which typically is usually a martini glass or a variant of a martini glass, because then you're sipping um, the lovely ingredients through the cream instead of it all being sort of homogenized. It just adds a dimension of uh, 
something a bit more interesting to the palate. But at any rate, this is an example of a nice tropical drink. And just to review, we used light rum, but golden rum uh, would be preferable. We used some dark rum. We used a bit of grenadine. In this, with this particular drink, the number 19, I did not use coconut rum. Um, and I used a bit of Kurswasser, which is, you know, the German uh, sour cherry. Um, it's not exactly a liqueur, it's more of a cocktail mixer. But it's very good because, again, it adds something that people can't quite figure out. And again, it was shaken, although it could be stirred. There's no problem with that. And I did add a float of peach-flavored brandy to the top of it. But again, things like Midori, like Chambord, which is a raspberry liqueur, and of course Midori is a melon liqueur, it adds complexity to the drink and kicks it a notch above. And again, tropical drinks are quite potent. They can really sneak up on you because they taste deceptively mild, but they really pack um, quite a kick at the end. So it's sensible, you know, to pace yourself if you're drinking them or if you're making them. And again, you can imagine how the interest in Polynesian food proliferated, you know, after the interest in the tropical drinks. That's when we had Hawaiian and Polynesian style ribs and, and even the pig that is done, done in its entirety in the ground and Polynesian style fish. And of course, of course all the um, accompaniments to those dishes, very lovely and very good. And again, never be afraid to experiment when you're making cocktails. And it's not wrong to consult a really good um, cocktail guide like Trader Vic's. And as you can tell, this is really dog-eared and worn. This particular edition goes back to 1971. His first edition was 1946. And of course, the little black book of cocktails is always a handy little guide. And it's very nicely done too because they encourage making the cocktails from scratch and not from mixes. So it always makes it just a bit better. But using that as a base and adding other ingredients is always more interesting, and especially with tropical drinks. And again, on future episodes, we're going to also do some non-alcoholic drinks and we're going to do some other drinks from other parts of the world, like mules that have um, gained a, a more of an interest and a following because there's been a resurgence with them. Also, they are based on ginger beer and usually rum, sometimes vodka. And again, we always appreciate the fact that there's an interest and we appreciate the fact too that people are becoming more experimental with cocktails. But always remember, moderation in our imbibing of cocktails is important. We want to keep our community safe and well spoken of. And overdoing and putting ourselves in jeopardy, or worse yet, other people, we don't want to do that. So we want to be careful and balanced in what we do. And thank you again for tuning in to another episode of Good Libations, which is our show about mixology and truly fine drinks. Thank you again. I'm Ethel Andrews, and this is the conclusion of another episode. Goodbye.